Hello there, and welcome to our latest video chat in the Money Show Expert Interview Series. I'm Mike Larson, Editor-in-Chief at Money Show, and today I have the pleasure of speaking with Mark Mills, co-founding partner at Montrose Lane Ventures. Montrose Lane invests in companies that serve the entire energy complex, among other sectors. The firm leverages the collective experience and relationships of its principals in the energy, industrial, and technology sectors to help drive growth of the companies in which it invests. Mark, thanks for joining me today. Great to be here. Looking forward to the big event. Awesome. Awesome. Well, let's start. Um, you know, your focus is on energy and again, more specifically, companies that help make energy affordable, safer and environmentally friendly. Um, what developments are you seeing in the energy market here and what are some of the implications for investors that are, might be watching today? Yeah, well, I'm I am. And as, as uh, those who already know my writing and work, I'm tech, very technology focused, both on the demand and supply side of energy, things that will result in higher demands than many people expect, and then how we supply the energy. I'm also, as a lot of people probably know, if they don't, I'll state it here, uh, skeptical that we'll be abandoning the use of hydrocarbons, oil, gas, and coal. In fact, I would put it inversely. Uh, you would probably call me an oil bull in the sense that I think the demand is probably going to be greater than most people realize. And notwithstanding tremendous increases in the use of wind and solar and electric cars, all that's going to happen too. So what I want to talk about and what I want people to understand is what, if you like the physics of energy or the physics of money, maybe the right way to put it, you know, money drives markets, how they work. Physics determines what you can do uh, with energy using and energy producing machines. So what I, what I study, what I'm interested in and what our fund focuses on are what are the game changers and what are people missing? Well, one thing we know that people are missing broadly is underestimating the demand for oil, which means investing in the oil and gas business, arguably as important as in the other ones. We do that. Uh, they're also, I think, underestimating the impact of uh, automation, robots, simplistically, and uh, software, again, son of chat GPT, you know, AI. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're at a, an inflection, which is particularly important. It's a focus of my book, The Cloud Revolution. It's a focus of my energy explorations. The inflection that we're at is that software and automation, robots and AI, writ simplistically, are finally at a point where they're getting useful for industrial activities. That's been a long slog to make those technologies really useful, economically uh, efficient and have efficacy that it's sort of a operational and safety perspective. We're at a tipping point where the technologies that make robots possible, literally robots that are anthropomorphic, dog-like or human-like, that can uh, accompany, work with, amplify or replace people in dangerous and uh, we'll call it high-risk industrial environments. Mm -hmm. that, those, those now, we know they exist. We don't have to guess anymore. So what we're now guessing is how fast their applications grow Similarly, in the software side, applying software to areas other than the back office, you know, back office software, accounting, spreadsheets, planning and forecasting, pretty easy. The, the, the app space is full of that stuff. The software that can move to the front lines that can not just automate trucks, automate you know, vehicles, automate mm -hmm. the manufacturing systems, automate chemical systems, those have been very, very tough to make safe and reliable. We're we're on the cusp of that being possible now too. So that that's what I what I what I focus on in terms of our investment metrics. It's also what uh, what I think people need to focus on in terms of understanding where the real the real world's going to go in the next decade. Got it. I believe was that something that you had called? I, I saw a speech you made referring to the grand nexus of, of energy and indu industrial and everything. That seems like it was something akin to what happened in the 1920s. Correct? Exactly. So we my book focuses on the the, the intersection of three domains: a great nexus of uh, an efflorescence, if you like, of new technologies a century ago. It wasn't the invention of the airplane that happened in the 1920s, obviously, because the airplanes were invented before that. Same for yeah. the car, same for polymers and pharmaceuticals and electric motors and electric generation, telephones. All those things had been invented before 1920s. But the 1920s is when they all became good enough to be useful enough for widespread dissemination and use in markets by consumers and businesses. Mm -hmm. So that's when we got the great boom. And they were related, but not but not the same spheres. It, it was an interesting coincidence that telegraphy became telephony and we got better science, if you like, not just from communications uh, and better indus industrial sort of coordinations from communications. That happened at the same time as cars became uh, cost-effective as airplanes started to become useful. The confluence of those things, that nexus was incendiary in economic growth terms. 
I think we're at the same point. The 2020s look a lot like that in the exact same spheres of information and machines like 3D printers and bio bioelectronic machines. And in uh, the space, of course, of the uh, cloud revolution itself, the information uh, utility that the cloud is. It's not a communication system. It's not a computing system. It's actually an information and inference utility function, which we know. We, do, we use it in a simplistic form already. You know, mapping is an inference based advisory function. It's not a computation function. You start thinking about applying that to all manner of products and services, it's a big deal. So we're, we are, I think, uh, in terms of machines of automation, the machines of manufacturing, the information domain, and of course, the uh, materials domain, which usually people don't focus on. We're very focused yep. on the shite briny, you know, the bright shiny objects. <laughs> the shite briny would be an Irish expression for what happens when you have too many, too much Guinness. But anyway, the, the bright shiny, the bright shiny objects of wow, look at that robot. That's well, pretty cool. Or the Chat GPT can compose a sonnet. Nice. But a lot of this is animated and made possible by really profound advances in the material sciences that make it possible to build things like robots and build things like uh, you know artificial intelligence engines and build things like uh, biocompatible sensors that we will increasingly see used for healthcare. Uh, th this materials revolution, the meta materials, materials that do things that are impossible in nature, smart materials, which is a clunky word for materials that are reactive to the environment. You know, self-healing materials are, are are smart materials. We these are not things that are in science fiction anymore. They're being rolled out in niche markets so far. So I mean, analogously, imagine it's a niche market in the 1920s and uh, pharmaceuticals and polymers. It'd be a pretty big deal to you know, own that sector if you like the the big boom in the chemical industry from the 1920s. Sure. If you were in the 1970s. Uh, in early 80s, you know, computing was pretty much a niche market and people knew it was a big deal, but it, you know, you'd have to have bought a basket of computing companies to have got Apple right at that time. So you know, if I'm an investor, I'm trying to think about not just who the winner is, but what's the sector where I should own a basket? So from an investment perspective, that's how I think about this new revolution as well. Okay. You know, one thing that gets a lot of press is, is sort of Washington's role in, in all of this. I mean, you had, you had, you have the podcast called The Last Optimist, and you talked about a tsunami yeah. of energy transition spending. How do you think that's going to play out given the political environment? And, and what are some implications yeah. for investors there? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm a, there's big implications. It's a lot of money. We're talking <laughs> about approaching a trillion dollars collectively in the various various pieces of legislation of government stimulus spending, loans, guarantees, grants. Uh, it's a lot of money. Uh, so I'll, let, let me first be the, the, the cynic that even if it's, and a lot of it will be misspent, set aside uh, kleptocracy and criminality, which it's hard to avoid with that much money gushing out of the Washington troughs, uh, that'll happen. But it, it, that's, I won't call it the noise, it's the big numbers. If 10% is theft, that's hundred billion dollars of theft. It's pretty bad, but most of it will be misspent because governments aren't smart enough to pick winners and losers on average, despite the tropes about, you know, we got to the moon. Okay. That's the exception, not the rule. We got to the moon. We, we didn't get to the moon because of government technology, but because of a, you know, a one shot deal, put 12 people on the moon once. And we're not even back yet. I mean, if we're talking <laughs> half a century, you know, so the government, the government's moral hazard of throwing money in the markets is very real. If you're an investor, you can chase that money. I mean, there's no question that people will make money because companies that receive that kind of free money, because it's, it's our money, but it's free to the company, more or less, uh, will do, you know, they'll have a growth spurt. Some of them may survive the growth spurt and become good investments. So I, I don't discount that. It just makes me personally very nervous if I'm an investor trying to guess who's going to get the government money and who, who gets the government money really have something that's sustainable and it's not just a flash in the pan. So you don't know whether you're investing on a, a, a hoping the government will keep spending money or you got it right. Okay, maybe, you know, I, I'm not discounting. Governments can get some things right and you might guess the right one with them. Makes makes me, it, it sort of creates noise in the market. It creates churn. So government spends a lot of money on solar. Does that mean solar is going to replace Oh, let's change it to electric cars. Government's clearly spending lots of money on electric cars. Does that mean uh, electric cars are going to completely replace internal combustion engines and you've got no bets left in the conventional car world? Uh, I mean, if you think about it for 30 seconds, and I'll I'll do more than 30 seconds of my speech, <laughs> the answer is no, of course not. We're not going to be replacing all cars. There's lots of bets to be made on both. The, 
the government bet on EVs makes it harder for me as an investor to make the bet because I don't know what they do to overvalue things that are really not sustainable. Yeah. It's hard to figure that out. Not impossible, but it really muddies the water. So I think we have a lot of churn. In a way, this kind of ironically, the combination of the chaos in the markets and the, and the government injecting more cloud uh, confusion uh, means it's really hard to do indexes anymore, right? You really you become a stock picker because you're really trying to, you know, pierce the pierce the noise. Uh, I'm bullish about the American economy, but I don't know. I mean, I think governments and the Fed could induce a recession. You can make money in stocks in a recession. It's, we've got lots of, you know, retrospective evidence to know that you can do that. But now we're talking again, stock pickers world as opposed to yeah. index world. So I think I think what the government has done is muddy the waters, made it make it more important to be a wise stock picker, if you like. And I think the confusion will end. I mean, these are cyclical. We'll, we can't spend this amount of money for an infinite time. Uh, maybe it lasts a couple more years. Uh, so in those two years, you know, where do I go? So I look at fundamentals. What, what does technology permit? I might get it wrong personally on something the government pumps up that was a good bet and you could do the classic pump and dump, get in with them, get out before it goes away <laughs> because some of the stuff they're going to create will be very bubble-like. And what, what is not bubble-like? Well, you know, look, batteries are going to be around for a long time. Uh, I think lithium batteries, for example, could be a good trade depending on who's doing it, where, but it may not be obvious what the right trade is on that. That's So that's a long answer to we've injected confusion We've injected opportunity to make money based on government bets. I, I'm a kind of, I'm a free marketer. I was a Reagan Republican. I worked for in the Reagan White House as a kid, literally as a kid, I guess, <laughs> a 20 something. Uh, and so I've got an imprinted by uh, more faith in markets than in governments. I like government's role, but it's a very different thing in terms of markets. So, uh, I think we'll revert back to more faith in markets in due course. But we're in, we're in a, a more faith in government cycle, yeah. so it, it'll be it, it'll it'll get it'll be interesting. There'll be some really big winners who who guess this right. Mark, you know, as we wrap up here, obviously we're excited to have you there uh, joining us at the Money Show Traders Expo in Las Vegas in April. Um, any sneak peek, any other tidbits you wanted to add about what you might be talking about there before we wrap things up? Well, since we have this this mania to ban the sale of an internal combustion engines and only you can only buy electric vehicles, I'll I'll, I'll do an, uh, an advanced preview of a conclusion and I'll state it in advance that it, it perhaps obvious what I'm going to say that won't happen. Uh, all the bans on the purchase of internal combustion engines will evaporate. They will go away. Uh, they will go away because markets won't tolerate the economic impact of forcing people to reduce their choices and buy vehicles that are on average far more expensive and are getting more expensive. So that will go away. If that's if you believe that, if you believe that's even possible, let's just say you're an EV bull and you think that that could happen. But if you're hedging your bet, you want to think about the consequences, who the winners and losers are. When the epiphany happens, <laughs> and it will happen in the near, very near future, that's, oops, we can't do that. Uh, there may be some big losers on that. Yeah. Well, Mark, I really do appreciate your time. Um, thank you so much for joining me and thank you all for watching. I do hope you enjoyed this interview. If you did, you're going to love seeing experts like Mark in person at the upcoming Money Show Traders Expo uh, in Las Vegas in April. We're bringing more than 75 speakers together, more than 100 presentations, keynotes, panel discussions, you name it. Um, so click the link in the video description below. You can learn how to join us at this new venue for 2023, which is the Paris Las Vegas. Mark, thanks again for your time. Great to join you. See you in Vegas.